Um, so one of the organizers asked me to uh, give a lecture. Uh, I knew that in this room uh, specialists on USB or World War One, World War Two, Vietnam War. So I tried to find a topic that in a way could be interesting for everybody here. And, and I thought that the issue of the instance of liminality, which is what all veterans have in common, was, was a good idea. So let me start by by saying a few words about actually World War One in France, which is really my my field of study at that point. So um, from November 1918 to the spring of 1920, five million French veterans were demobilized, age group by age group, the survivors of a major <coughs> collective catastrophe where 10 million men, immediately more, were killed. This is when the Great Century was born, and this is also when a whole generation of young men came of age. Among these survivors was Eastman Jules Isaac, a well known French historian who had been recruited by Edition Hachette prior to World War I to edit with his colleague Albert Mallet a series of textbooks on, on French history, later known as Mallet Isaac. Although too old to be mobilized in 1914, Mallet turned up as a volunteer and it was reported missing in the Artois incident of September 1915. Julie Sack also fell in, in World War I. He was severely wounded in Berlin in 1917, but he survived. In 1919, he wrote a piece called Nous les revenons, which means in French both we, the returnees, those who returned from war, but also we, the ghosts, well known as also ghosts in French. And Isaac's words resonate as a challenge for all of us historians, all of us here in this room, who work on the Soviet homecoming and in the modern era. Here's what uh, Jules Isaac wrote in this uh, newly published in April 1919 in the Revue de Paris. If not from beyond, return from far away, from these formidable boundaries between life and death where few men before us had spent time. You think that you know us, gentlemen, gentlemen meaning civilians, well that's right. Do not be mistaken, you do not know us anymore. You will not know us ever again. We are marked with a secret sign that you cannot see. We have come back from the dead. How many men of the lost generation across Europe shared the same impression of having been plunged into an extreme environment made of mass death, constant danger, and intense suffering, and of returning to the life both changed by the experience and radically different from the rest of the population, meaning from the younger and the older generations, from their mothers, from their wives, from their daughters, from civilians. When the, war, when, the, when the war broke out in August 1914, historian Charles Edmund Carrington, uh, age 17, was preparing for university entrance examinations. And you know, of course, he was probably busy with the author of the well known book on the pieces of homecoming, uh, Sawyer from the Wars of China, published in 1965. Uh, although underage, he volunteered in the Kitchener's army and joined uh, the Royal Warshire Regiment, fought in the Battle of the Somme, and finished his education at Oxford after the mobilization in 1919. And here's what he wrote about his experience and also about this new generation, the last generation. Middle aged men are united by secret bonds and separated from their fellows who are too young or too old to fight in the Great War. They were in the 60s, 65, so more than 40 years after the end of World War I, 15 years after the end of the World War II. Particularly, the, the generation of young men was obvious before the characters were formed, who were under 25 and 14, is conscious of a distinction, for the war made them what they are. Generally speaking, the secret army presents to the world the front of silence and bitterness, which it has fashionable, been fashionable to describe as desertion. The 
the secret army speaking the language of silence, what better description of most veterans actually returning from war. This is also what the French novelist Jean Moulin wrote in Les Fleurs de Table in 1941. Each man found himself mysteriously stricken with a disease of language. For these survivors, the return to banality, the return to the banality of everyday life, was almost unbearable. Some felt out of proportion to the new conditions of life in this time. Others felt diminued, diminished, to use Louis Aragon's words. And it's probably, I imagine, one of the most wonderful novels uh, about returning from the Great War, which actually was published in 1944, must be in the end of World War II, at the end of World War II. But it's a book about a veteran returning from World War I. Pierre Champion, under the veteran of World War I, described his own homecoming in the novel Francois de Calvet, published in 1954. We found all newspapers on our table, and of letters from the month of August 1914. We read about the plans from that time. We tried to resume our usual occupations again. And none of all this seemed in the least worthy of interest to us. Many gaps, many absent men, but dream of a new world, and what we found instead was a very ordinary, monotonous one. All of you in this room will recognize a reality that characterizes most veterans in the modern era. Veterans are the most by definition men, now women, in transition. Veterans have expressed a major change in their social identity from wartime to peacetime, from the front line to the young front, from the social status of combatants living with their brothers in arms to the status of outsiders in post war societies. That said, don't get me wrong, each transition is inscribed in the history of a specific conflict. Each transition is inscribed in the context of a specific time and culture. Each transition is inscribed in the rules of a specific society. Or to put it differently, and it's going to be a discussion that we can have with Jonathan Shea tomorrow, the internal veteran does not exist, even if most veterans have been through the same experience of liminality. So let me start by clarifying what I mean by uh, liminality and how this notion encapsulates some of the challenges of transition from which we use. Uh, as you know, the British anthropologist Victor Turner first introduced this notion of liminality in the 1960s after reading the ethnographer uh, Anna Benjamin, uh, famous book published in 1908, Rites de Passage, Rites of Passage. In this rite of passage, uh, Bantinet uh, explored the fundamental process underlying the change of an individual status in, in society. Here's what you write. For groups as well as for individuals, life itself means to separate and to be reunited, to change form and condition, to die and to be reborn. It is to act and to cease, to wait and rest, and then to begin acting again but in a different way. Bunjan, who, as you know, studied specifically the landmarks in, uh, of human life, such as birth, puberty, marriage, or death, found that, as a general rule, there were you know, three major stages in the rites of passage. First one is separation, a detachment of the subject from its stabilized environment. Second one is transition, or what calls the liminal stage, and use uh, uses the, the word linen, which, which the Latin for pressure, or this middle stage, when the individual becomes a, a civilian outsider with no clear defined status of role, and, and that's very important, of course, for veterans. And the third and final stage of the rite of passage reincorporation uh, that's that we just presented with, with the study of, of, of objects, and the subject has crossed the threshold and is allowed to adopt a new status uh, and to re enter society. If this reincorporation does not offer something the most impossible in, in traditional societies, in pre modern societies, if you want, probably because they are too inclusive as in a way in the game, uh, reincorporation was always had 
but it's something that, that is quite common in, in high modern societies, liminality, that, and that's one of the topics that I would like to, to discuss today. When Belgium was translated from French in the 60s, uh, Victor Turner expanded our understanding of liminality, and that's actually uh, Turner's definition of liminality that I would like to use today to uh, study the case of, of veterans. Uh, the first point that uh, Turner makes, and that's pretty important, is that liminality is, is an expense of time and space. And uh, he writes that, uh, I think it's, it's important that, that liminality, this liminal time, is, is an instant of pure potentiality when the past is momentarily negated, suspended, or abrogated, and, and the future has not yet begun. The second aspect of liminality, according to, to Turner, is an original experience of communitas, uh, uh, what he calls a heightened sense of union among group members. The different communities is also characterized by a, a specific social, or even say psychological social. And, and finally, Turner suggests uh, that uh, luminancy provides a catalyst for the creative impulse. According to him, I quote him, luminancy frequently generates myths. Uh, symbols, rituals, philosophical systems, works of art, these social forms provide a set of templates, models, or patterns which are periodical that reclassifications of reality. They incite us to action as well as to thought. So let's come back to the uh, issue of, of transitions from war to peace and to the issue of our veterans. So for us, we will work on, on, on the transitions from war to peace. This definition of liminality applies to so many different aspects of, of a transition forward to peace, even if the um, kind of tribunal structure, I like that word, tribunal, so you know, the French law, it's organized in three parts, but it, it, you know, even if this kind of tribunalized structure of the right of passage might seem slightly uh, artificial, let's now explore the three dimensions, if you want, of, of liminality. Liminality as a suspension of time and space. Liminality as a communal experience, something that veterans experience together, and liminality as a catalyst for the creative impulse so in the context of, of veterans' homecomings by following commonest trajectories from the moment of separation to uh, the moment of reintegration and by exploring what most experiences of homecoming have in common. So we most often think of Soviet homecoming as a voyage. Uh, in, spy, in space and time, and, and rightly so, I think. If you take Homer's uh, Odyssey to the director, uh, Michael Chino's 1978 film, from Erich Meyermark's uh, novel published in 1951, The Road Back, to David Bingle's uh, Thank You for Your Service, uh, published in 2013, or, or Field Place Redeployment, uh, published in 2014. Every veteran is described as a voyager, as a pilgrim, or as a, as a vagabond. Homecomings always involve a progressive distancing from what we usually identify as the existence of, of time and space in, in wartime. Every demobilization is a journey with its own faces, with its own rhythms, with its own rituals. In World War One and World War II, veterans were repatriated by train, by boat. In, in 1990, for instance, it took almost two weeks for repatriated billboards to, to cross the Atlantic. And that's an interesting picture that we are billboards arriving in New York City in the spring of 1919, which, which is, you know, when you show that at least in the early 20th century, demobilization was, was a long process. And like what happens after Vietnam. Uh, which is probably the kind of turning point. Repatriation by boats uh, here to Hoboken uh, uh, followed, was followed, of course, by the repatriation of, of men to the origin of origin by, by train. So uh, it's a kind of long transition. It's also kind of transition from the horizontality of the battlefields to the verticality. You can see here clearly on this, on this uh, amazing picture the verticality of, of the city. So my thing also, which is something that, that veterans have not really, that historians have not really explored, uh, the, uh, the demobilization not only of, of men, uh, but also the demobilization of, of senses, but the demobilization of, of hearing at the time of the of silence in the post-war period, 
and also of, of sight. You know what it means again to transition from from a kind of world where everything is horizontal when you live in the trenches to that, right? To to your to to your uh, city of, of origin. So think also of the colonial soldiers of World War One or World War Two uh, uh, from guns who, from Australia, New Zealand, and for them the return home would take several weeks, sometimes a month. So again, how different? From cases of Vietnam vets returning from their tour of duty, uh, or veterans from the wars in Iraq or Afghanistan put on commercial flights sometimes to return home. Uh, and and that's something that Tim O'Brien uh, describes in his, in his book, If I Die in a Combat Zone, published in 1973. And what he calls the, uh, kind of, for him, the, the homecoming is, is among something artificial. And here's what uh, Tim O'Brien again. Uh, writes in If I Die in Combat Zone, published in, in the early 70s. The airplane uh, smells and feels artificial. Uh, the students uh, carefully squares, carefully smile and boredom, does not understand. She serves a meal and passes out magazines. The plane lands in Japan and takes on fuel. Then you fly straight on to Seattle. What kind of war is that? Is it that begins and ends that way with a pretty girl and magazine? So, same thing, you know, it's, it's like being the last tourist. I think that game is a major, major transition in, in the 20th century. Uh, so, no time left for them to process the experience and no time left to mold the dead and, and no time left to progressively get used to the idea of, of returning home, which I think is, is a major, again, element. Um, so let's start an exploration of, of the Soviet homecoming with the kind of keynote, the moment of, of leave taking from comrades in arms. And what Vangenev, the Victor Turner, will call separation. Uh, so often I think this is actually overlooked. Demobilization, which are organized on an individual basis. Think of, uh, again, the Sawyer's returning from the American Sawyer's returning from Vietnam, or collectively think of World War I and World War II, demobilization brings about the dissolution of a group of soldiers. And, and with it, that, that are intense human relationships. In terms of the war, the primary group, to use the notion invented after World War II by, by Schultz and, and Janowitz in 48, uh, the primary group is, is one of the, we all know that, it's one of the most important sources of. Of support and survival, it provides a form of mutual security, it provides, it maintains social cohesion in extreme situations by, for example, you know, ensuring the redistribution of packages sent by a family or by transmitting practical know how or by lowering of the sharing of emotions. When he returns from the war, the soldier has little choice but, but, but to accept the end of this important form of, of group solidarity. The soldiers mourn and, and soon. Idealize it actually, the frontline commander. Most of the is still, is still come several years later. And I think of the veterans of World War I that I studied. In many ways, um, if you think of veterans of organizations created the, sometimes during the war itself, disabled veterans, but, but in the immediate after of World War I, the major ones, there are two, two candidates for the, you know, the if you think of, of veterans of associations in the the aftermath of World War I. The first one is to defend veterans' rights. And the second one is to promote camaraderie. And in a way, to, to, to create a new fictive kinship. So, who was hell, frontline was hell, you know, the trenches were, were terrible, that we were all together. And this is one of the meanings of the famous motto uh, of uh, the French veterans in the 20s and 30s, and it's actually the medal um, by the uh, Union Nationale des Combattants, one of the main uh, veterans associations in the 20s, Uni comme au front, united as at the front, which you know, it's, not, it's not because you live together that you are really united in you know, tensions, you know, it's a kind of idealization again of this kind of idea. So it's the idea of prolonging in the aftermath of World War I the same kind of, of unity, and it's also a way to distance yourself from civilians. From the politicians of the 20s, who are not united. Again, veterans are bad in the that's, that's what this medal says. So, in the case of a war position like World War I, uh, demoralized soldiers also leave behind fields of battle where you know, countless comrades 
uh, are, are buried. Uh, so primary groups were also, in a way, communities of, of the living and, and the dead. And here's, for instance, uh, Edith Maria Romar, who all know uh, Romar for, for his famous uh, All Fight of the Western Front. That's um, actually uh, the road back. The Gerbeck Zurich published in 1931 is really less, less famous. And you know, so I don't know if you know about it, but if you, I really encourage you to, to read this, this very, very interesting novel. And in the opening scene, their first chapter, Renaud describes a group of uh, German soldiers on, on the front line in the immediate aftermath of, of the armistice of November 1918. Here's what he writes They are many indeed who lie there. Though until now I have not thought of it so, but just all remain there together, we the trace, obey the grace, we the trenches, divided only by a few handfuls of earth. They were but a little before us, they became less and they more, and often we have not known whether we already belonged to them or not. But now we are going back to life and they mass stay. So it's very clear again, it's distancing yourself from the dead and living beyond the fields of battle where, where so many comrades and arms are, are other. So the end of this community of the living of the dead, right? But also the, the disappearance and, 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 so, and the, visit, the disappearance of, of an identity, but also the reconstruction of, of another identity. So one of the demobilized soldiers' greatest fear, I think, as it appears in the letters, especially you know, I studied many letters in my, my first um, book, that is from the year. One of the greatest fears is probably of not being able to find the place to gain in civilian life, their place to gain in civilian life. And in the work with survivors, uh, many psychiatrists describe the nightmare uh, common to most returning veterans. They return to their homes, to their families, they attempt to speak, but they are neither heard or recognized. So this study can, can perhaps be explained, and you can find that in many you know, works published by psychiatrists in the interval period or, or after World War II. This nightmare can perhaps be explained by the reference to uh, the survival syndrome, the syndrome of, of survival guilt, uh, extensively studied, as you know, by the psychiatrist. Uh, uh, William Midlands in the, in the 50s, who actually uh, neither worked specifically with um, uh, survivors of the Holocaust. It's very interesting to, to see it again what it means to be a survivor. Of course, being a survivor of the Holocaust is different from being, being a, a veteran, but, but, but the concept, as you know, of survivor of skills is, is also commonly used for, for, for veterans. So most veterans experience a feeling of having survived at the price of another's life of being alive when they should be dead. I am alive, they are dead, they are therefore given their lives for me. And Albert Goss, in 1919, uh, is famous, that's one of the most famous scenes, right? If you, 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 you've seen Albert Goss, which is uh, this fantastic. Now, it's a crystal version, as you know, basically, 1919, but also 1938 version. I love the 1919 version where, where the, which, I mean, is very interesting in terms of the blurring boundaries between the living and the dead and, and the presence of a ghost. And, and as you know, in a very famous scene, uh, Avengers imagines the dead of the Great War rising from the battlefield, rising from the grave to see that survivors have been worthy of a sacrifice. Which is, you know, a way also to extract that kind of survival guilt. And it's a very, very intense, very interesting scene. And it's exactly what Tim O'Brien, again, uh, says in, in his uh, book, uh, The Things They Carry, uh, uh, and in which the uh, narrator confessed, I watched a man die on a train near the village of uh, Mike, and I, I didn't kill him, but I was present, you see, and my presence was guilt now. I remember his face. And I remember feeling the burden of responsibility and grief. I blamed myself, and rightly so, because I was present. According to Nancy Sherman, the professor of philosophy at Georgetown University, today most young soldiers, I quote her, train with set ideals that encourage life and wise thinking, never leave the body behind, bring everyone home, 
minimize collateral net damage. And as visions get harder, you can't do all those things at once. You can't even do most of the those things well. So there are a lot of, a lot of a lot compromises that people might not have been prepared to make. And this is exactly what John Shea when he says when he introduces this notion of more injury. I know that he's going to, to present on that uh, tomorrow. So beyond this sense of guilt, which looks very strong for, for most veterans, there's also a problem of identity. The veterans have been changed by the war. Their bodies have changed. Their psychology has changed. The way they perceive the world around them has changed. So this feeling of estrangement can sometimes be used as a, as a kind of alienation of self and body. And, and I, I want to present um, a, I think it's an interesting you know, collection of, of, of interviews. I don't know if you, if you know this, but uh, made by Sweden Alexievich with Poly Island, one of the major authors of the uh, late 20th century, early 21st century. She uh, is a journalist and she's a recent Nobel Prize for Literature Laureate. And she interviewed uh, veterans of the uh, Afghanistan War, the Afghanistan, in the 80s. Uh, and the book called Zinky Boys, the, the title of the book, right? Uh, Zinky Boys, Study Voices from the Afghanistan War. Uh, and so it's a very interesting model, actually, of all history. And here's what one of the Afghans, is one of the survivors of one of the veterans of the Afghans in the war, writes, After I got back, I couldn't bear to wear my pre-war jeans and shirts. They belonged to some stranger, although they still smelled of me, as my mother showed me. That stranger did no longer exist. His place had been taken by someone else with the same family name. So being recognized. After long months, cut off from their families and, and transformed, often physically actually, by the agents of war, the question of recognition is a worry shared by, by all returning veterans. And if you think about that, again, if you I read again Tom and Che, I guess in Vietnam, and, and well, this is in America before, before the conference, and, and it's exactly what he says about uh, uh, Book 19 of, of the USA. Those are very specific moments that is sometimes missed, but it's essential in the long homecoming, in, in Odysseus' long homecoming. And that's when Odysseus is, is recognized by his old partners, uh, Eurycleia, who, who, as you know, uh, recognizes the scar that he has. So it's, it's, it's interesting to see that, that it's a kind of key moment of that again, the transformation is presented here as a bodily, as a bodily transformation. But to be recognized, is not simply to recover one's pre-war identity. It's also to be recognized as a veteran, to obtain gratitude for citizens rendered and compensation, which is, uh, of course, not the same thing for the material and psychological costs inflicted by the war. So both gratitude and compensation, which leads actually to this, you know, kind of redefinition of the rights of, of veterans in the immediate aftermath of World War I. So the second element to come into most cases of, of soldiers returning from, from the war is the vast question of, of the gratitude civilians express or, or refuse to express to veterans. In my view, this problem has, has long been underestimated as victims of war became increasingly unfamiliar to Western society since Vietnam or as or seen as the franco war in the case of France, these societies, our society, that these were civilians, ceased to understand the importance of what I've called in my, in my first book, the, the moral economy of gratitude, which is, I think, a key, a key element in the reconstruction of identities, the moral economy of gratitude, the complex, and if you think about that, finely structured collection of, of rituals and, and gestures medals, uh, celebrations, uh, commemorative objects, thanks to which veterans feel that their experience of war has been uh, at least in part recognized. And I, I really think that it's a kind of combination of both collective expressing something and something very personal. And that's fascinating to see how our medal, which of course always general, you know, made them. I would mean by the collective, but it's, it's received, of course, as something extremely, uh, extremely personal. I think this is so part of the 
it's also something that maps be integrated in kind of probably, of course, memory of the content, which is how veterans share their experience with, with, their, with their loved ones. So clearly, how wars end constitutes a very important challenge for society as a whole. Something grasped actually as early as 1919, 1918, by a uh, psychiatrist called Abraham, who's not slightly forgotten now, but Carl Abraham was a close collaborator of uh, Sigmund Freud. And they published a very interesting article in 1918 called Contribution to Psychoanalysis of War Neurosis, in which he explained a very simple thing that he drew attention to the simple but the crucial fact that veterans generally experience a, a feeling of profound loss, the feeling provoked by the death of friends, of the first death of World War I, ruined health, the loss of four years, and that it's a sense of loss that, that nothing could, could compensate. In this context, the moral economy of gratitude is an essential part of the veteran's position for a of peace. And related to what Turner described as liminality as a communal experience, you, you don't you never return from war alone. You return as a member of a group. Even if you return actually, even if there is a kind of individual homecoming, you always, you are always part of a kind of imaginary community. And um, and, and, and a catalyst, humanity as a catalyst for the creative impulse. So homecomings are at times of recomposition of the fabric of society. And that's why that's interesting. You know, many sort of when I study my First book, and quite a long time ago now, it was published in 2004. Uh, most people felt that you know, they were especially in World War I. We're interested, of course, who ended their work basically on November 11, 1918, and especially so the Troyes. And you know, most people felt that you know, demobilization is at the time suspended between war and peace with no value and no interest. And so it was not like a century ago. And so, uh, again, uh, the it's essential because it's really the moment of recomposition of the fabric of society and, and, and the, the moment of ex expression of intense emotions. There are also moments when each sign of appreciation matters, medals, parades, even uh, I want you to give you a few examples. For instance, that these commemorative sake cups uh, offered to uh, by the Imperial Japanese Army to its veterans. It's a long tradition to give to every veteran its own sake cup, which you know is interesting. Of course, it's related to, to food or drink and, and also to something sort of very personal, but also uh, it's also part of the history, the history of the military story of Japan. Or um, these objects, which of course for obvious reason I'm, I'm very interested in, is the commemorative helmet given to each French survivor, each French veteran of World War I. So you have to imagine producing a, like, a less than almost 18 months, 5 million commemorative uh, elements. So that's the Adrian uh, Almet, uh, the Castellino, and we place tag, uh, commemorative tag here, that says, Soldier of the Great War. This is what you are. You are a soldier of the Great War. And not soldier of the World War II. Soldier of the Great War. So, using the word used by veterans as early as 1915, this is the Great War. We're, we're completely different from what we've seen before. So, again, it's, it's very interesting because objects like this one are, are, of course, elements of appreciation, but they also give the context, the meaning. They, 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 in a way, there's a kind of performative of, of these objects who, who give sense, in a way, to what the soldiers have experienced. So, according to the French military psychiatrist Claude Barrois, in his Psychanalyse de published in 1983, obtaining a pension, being awarded a decoration, having one's name mentioned in some historical document or other, these are not regressive satisfactions like those of the serving students duly awarded. They reassure veterans that the collective, collective, recognizes its death and that failures of suffering inscribed in flesh and mind life had been given meaning. Such tokens of gratitude, often carried very discreetly or even hidden, indicate absolutely no sense of social security. On the contrary, they signify reassurance that the veterans belong to the state and nation, that's what they call the fabric of society. As in Kelly affirmed, this gratitude is a fundamental 
condition of the soldier's reintegration into freestyle life. It reinforces his sense of existential, that is, psychosocial coherence, which has been shaken by the unforgettable excess of war. Which is pretty wild. It showed that, of course, you're different. Of course, you're totally different. But in a way, you're still the same game. You, you, there is a kind of coherence in what you have done. And, and the object in which you shows you the medal, or even the parade, the, the ritual organized, gives you some kind of courage, which is a way, it's essential, of course, for reconstruction of, of professions. So most soldiers, and in a way, these objects could be presented as the most transitional objects that allow also for the sharing of experience with, with family and, and friends. Uh, so there are actually two ways of think about that, and I'll talk about that, and talk about that for the QA or, or later in the uh, um, uh, dinner. But I, I think there are two forms of objects in a way the company uh, veterans in the transition back to the life. The first one are these objects that express the more economic gratitude, the other ones are trophies. And that would be very interesting to see a connection between trophies and, and the uh, a small economic of virtue, they are different, of course, totally different. You know, the trophy is individualized by itself. The, the value of the trophy is associated with something specific, a specific moment, a specific place, and you are the one who took that specific object on the battlefield or, or somewhere. Uh, of course, a medal is different. So, again, you know, it's there for you to see that, that's why I was so interested by, by Stephanie's presentation uh, in the last panel. Objects are essential to understand the. the Homecoming. <laughs> uh, thank you, by the way, very much for your paper. Uh, uh, objects are really essential uh, uh, to, to understand the, the transition from, from war to peace. So, most soldiers returning from war have felt this importance of objects, the importance of tokens of gratitude. All the more so, I think, as they generally felt out of face with the social norms of, of civil life. And this is the further element of all cases of, of soldiers returning from war. It's a return to peacetime norms. Uh, the state of war, as you know, is, is characterized by the complete upheaval of, of the frameworks of, of, of social life, uh, of everyday life. Uh, in what time soldiers go without sleep, they sometimes collapse from exhaustion in the middle of the day. They eat at irregular hours. Sometimes soldiers are also men without roofs over their heads. Many in the trenches because of the protection, because of the comfort, because of the sense of intimacy. That comes from living in a home, and, and finally, there are men who at times feel uncomfortable uh, or even humiliated by the impossibility of uh, looking after their bodies, uh, or differently, put it differently, the, the frameworks of social life, the, the distinction between day and night, uh, the difference between inside and outside, uh, the importance of physical appearance have been broken down by, by, by a war. So, when imagining their written home in letters. And again, that's one of the sources that I used in my first book. Competence often emphasize the, the normalization of material life. For them, a, an essential step in, in the return to the night. And you're very, you know, when you read the letters, of course, of, of sent by like, these victorious French soldiers of 1918 on November 12, 1918, right? The, the first thing they mentioned in the letter is something like that. They vote the, the good white bread, it's French, of course, but still, the good white, most of you can see right? The good white bread was color in a forgotten. Or the real bed in which it could stretch out nice and warm in the real sheet. So, what we might think, of course, that it's not essential, that, that these are mundane topics, but they're extremely important to, again, think about, about the imagined of the And I like this picture of. Uh, Dogo was returning to uh, the US in 1918 and, and, and savoring the, the, the tart taste and the cinnamon, the cinnamon smell of apple pies. For them, in a way, a reassuring flavor of their pre war existence, showing the kind of continuity between the pre war and the post war. Um, so, these topics, this idea of, the, in a way, the body agents of of demonization is, is essential to, to understand the, the reintegration into civil life. And it seems to me that one, can, one cannot study, for instance, the economic reintegration of, of veterans, which is, by the way, at least for worldwide, largely a 
next to the word fill, in which a great deal of work uh, remains to be done. We will start out with, with, with the these dimension of their redefinition. So we have the social concerns, the economic concerns, we work on the transition from war to peace, but what, what does it mean to rediscover the, the powers and the rules of, of work, or to reacquaint yourself with the practical know-how for the century of war, or even dealing with serious uh, handicaps, like, like you know, disabled or, or shell-stock uh, veterans, uh, have their own definition of, of limitability and at least uh, that I know I was going to present uh, tomorrow, I'm sure you will agree with me that, that again, the liminality is different, of course, completely different for, for disabled veterans. Uh, their own experience of liminality as a communal experience, and, and in the case of, of disabled veterans, the Gal Glacé, they, they, they transition to civil life. The, the associations play a very important role in, in terms of transition back to, to civil life. That said, uh, return to uh, norms of, of, of peace times are also peace time, also uh, return to, to more norms. And two examples of you know, the early 20th century of the, 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 the 70s, you know, what you get the best sales, the amazing now, not well known in the US, really amazing now on the uh, return of the, uh, the soldier from World War Captain Hanan, and a taxi driver, of course, 1976, uh, Matthew Scassini. Uh, they, in many ways, literature and cinema uh, draw attention to this figure of the, of the almost obsessed, this, this figure of the marginalized or, or the violent veterans, and they are contributing in a way to the alienation of, of real veterans, misunderstood, stigmatized, or, or confined to, to the liminal, uh, to the liminal space. So, in terms of, of right of passage, and, and again, that's been, I think quite important. What strikes me is how um, the rights of purification. That the pandemic amongst all stories of homecoming in, in pre modern societies have almost completely disappeared in, in the modern era. I mean, it depends what you mean by, by rights of, of purification, but still, the fear of contamination with contact with the dead, uh, what the Romans called uh, horror and sanguinis, uh, uh, prohibited returning warriors from entering civil life in the Sudan, actually, the civic space for several days, sometimes several weeks. And with the rise of Christianity, impurity was later transferred inward and associated with, with sin. And what radically changed with the experience of, of total war in, in the 20th century uh, was, of course, you know, battles as confrontation with the time and space, the intensification of the discourses and, and practices of violence, and also, of course, the mass mobilization of civilians, which is what? Which means that the rise of purification the rights of purification disappeared as they became useless. Demobilizing, demobilizing was no longer a matter of veterans returning from war. That's a matter of entire societies, including civilians returning from war. So again, you have to think about the different way I had to define demobilization. You know, we, we tend, as military historians, we tend to focus exclusively on the soldiers' demobilization, but after, well, I don't know what the, the civil war starts to say, but after one clearly, demobilizing means also reintegrating civilians into, uh, into uh, post war societies and, and, and turning away from the extreme hatred for the enemies in, in increasingly ideological conflicts. So I was thinking of the notion that my, my colleague and friend John Horn introduced the uh, famous World War II. Uh, introduced in 2001, the notion of cultural demobilization. And again, when you think of cultural demobilization, we think of the veterans returning from war, but what about the civilians' cultural demobilization? Again, recreating relationships with the enemy. And that's something, of course, I mentioned for families, and for, you know, especially for, I don't know, for, for many families who have lost, lost a lot of money in combat. So, in a way, the kind of liminality described by Amal Vanjana in the Indian Zone, just before uh, uh, World War I in many ways, did not survive, in my view, the cataclysmic existence of the Korean War. Finally, um, according to Vanjana, as you know, the, the third and final uh, phase of, um, of the rite of passage is reincorporation. That the term reincorporation raises the question of you know, reincorporation into what? When they returned home in 1918, 1919, veterans had to face the terrible realization that next to nothing 
remains of a life that I know. And life is uh, very simple, but I mean, they were passage from it's a, a, a book published by Maurice Joubert, well, this famous uh, French novelist of World War One, who writes something like, "When we were twenty, a new face." I think it was in this when he was eighteen. Uh, when we were 20 and looked back in the 20s, we saw nothing but ghosts and dead people. And you have to think that that's, a, that's really one of the big differences between World War I and any conflict in the 20th century. Is it that you, when you were a survivor, you were really a small minority in, in a society uh, after a, a cataclysmic conflict in that point of war. So, veterans, of course, often complain of civilians' inability to understand them, but at the same time, they argue that their experience was impossible to describe. And that again, uh, Louis Lebon, uh, writing about that, he, his character, began to miss the war. Well, not the war, the wartime years, he had never been able to find the rhythm of life again. He was still living in the day-to-day -day of the war, what it, what it means, and that will be uh, actually an interesting topic for all of us. What does it mean, the day-to-day -day of the war? And that's, of course, something totally different, I think, for the civil war, for World War II, to get there. But that's something that we call wartime. And that's still, you know, very important. There are two major, you know, elements, two major topics, wartime and, and the relation to space, again, what's in the landscapes of war. But that's something that is there, working on new Research on that. Uh, don't have time to talk about that. But it's it's really I think, something that, that matters. So uh, and, and yet inspires. So one of the advances, one of the Soviet veterans of the war in Afghanistan, interviewed by uh, Svetlana Alexievich, felt the same nostalgia for combat. And I can't. Uh, that's what he says. I can't settle down to this life anymore. War is better than this. It gives you a justification or an excuse for anything you do, good or bad, it's incredible. I know that that's the way I catch myself in the feeling sometimes. So the nostalgia from the front, which I think is an interesting notion, the nostalgia from the front is actually a notion described by Pierre Pialcha, a very famous French uh, theologian of the 20s and 30s, uh, who published an article on that, nostalgia from the front, and uh, for him, so again, it was priest for him. Uh, it was a nostalgia for an exceptional experience, and for him, it was an exceptional experience of faith, where the believer had to face danger constantly and, and, and had to give himself over completely to God. And here, he write, I, writes, "I cannot do the battle from anymore." That's what he writes in the immediate aftermath of the one. So the concept of nostalgia, of course, the disillusionment that sometimes dominates, and you all know that, that dominates the post war life and whose history largely remains to be the origin. It also tends to be all of the, is the return to, um, and I could like to the point I made uh, a few minutes ago, the return to the sensory environment at this time. One of the first kind of readjustment we think of about that. that veterans have to deal with, and, and a major component of the existence of, of liminality associated with the return uh, from, from the war. So what I call the demolition of, of uh, the hearing, the demolition of the sight, the existence of sights in their notebooks or their letters, most soldiers know the difficulty of getting used to silence. Getting used to silence in the immediate after the war. And for veterans of the war, you can imagine that. The first thing they say, again, uh, in the first hours, the first hour of the United States is the silence that dominates the battlefields, uh, that falls over from the United State. Over spoke how difficult it was for them at home not to look at the countryside through an imperfect uh, eyes, not to imagine trenches there, not to imagine danger everywhere. And that's when we know um, in You've seen probably psychiatrist words about veterans from Vietnam or from Iraq or from Afghanistan. And I want to give you an example of this um, uh, speech that a school principal in Bayonne, which is a Southwest France, uh, gave in the 20s. At the end of the war, back in my village, my lovely vast village, and here again I've watched the photo of admitting 
is a good, uh, when you reach West Virginia to you, to you, sorry. But I want to be completely truthful. It was through warriors' eyes that I saw a gorgeous countryside, covered in greenery and flowers. Here on that bridge, the Cherokees called a combat squad to take a position. There, a superb ambush rules. Farther on, with a superior survey, an ideal position for machine gun. Oh, the beautiful ways of enemy infantry who mow down. Everywhere, in the most lovely settings, the most peaceful, the obsession with combat, with killing, with death. It was still over the sight of, of blood, others that were too strong, or anything else that reminded them of their combat experience was unbearable. <coughs> Please don't gain one of the uh, uh, Avancies interviewed by Alexandra Svetlana Please don't tell me the war is over now. In summer, when I breathe the hot, dust air and or, or see a pool of stagnant water or smell of dry flowers in the fields, it's like a punch in the head. I'll be hunted by Afghanistan for the rest of my life. And recently, as you know, I've shown how trauma related orders are, are positive reminders of. of, of, of Post-traumatic events, for instance, others associated with explosions or, 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 or burning material, uh, how they trigger flashbacks and intrusive thoughts. I want to end with um, probably one of the uh, most famous uh, uh, French historians of the 20th century, uh, Marc Blanc, the inventor of, uh, of the uh, Anal School in the, in the 30s, who fought in, in World War I, and who uh, uh, said, uh, uh, we'll all remember the the, the bees sound of German bullets, it's quite his brain waves, uh, as if it were a wax of gramophone record, like a refrain ready to go at the first turn of the handle. He saw so he died, as you know, tragically in, in, in World War II. It was a, a recent fighter, and it was executed by the police in, in 1944. This is a very, it's probably you know, the model in many ways, uh, uh, it is a kind of hero for, for many, many songs. Uh, at a conference held in Strasbourg, uh, his, his son, Etienne Blanc, shared the memory of his father. And here's what he writes. I think I like this tension between silence and, and short memory. I think I never heard my father talk about the war. This silence was broken only once. And I will tell you under what circumstances. For this memory, this story was quite in my mind. But today, we were in an antique shop in a small city. I don't know which one anymore. And my father abruptly went outside, leaving my mother and me uh, behind. He could not bear the sight of mannequins leaning against the wall. It reminded him too much of the corpses that were his constant companions during the war. So the liminality of the war experiences is inscribed on, and we would say, into the bodies, and sometimes forever. Uh, in Greek antiquity, Liffy, one, one of the five rivers of the inner world, and the personification of oblivion was the daughter, as you know, of Ares, the Greek goddess of this court for was tribe. But for most versions of World War I, probably for actually most versions of the 20th century, oblivion was not an option. The memory of war became obsessive, survivors remained frozen in the past and lived in this liminal space for the rest of their lives, and that's why the uh, model used by the Jenna as the work for at least most of the 20th century and the 21st century, turning the page will be to betray the, the dead in many ways. So that kind of the great war had been gathered and lost to the site of North Canal in 1918. The French writer Jean Giraudot was the first to confront the war in 1931, in a beautiful novel called Le Grand Coupeau. And the book did not actually uh, exercise the memory. His famous 1958 essay titled Je ne peux pas I cannot forget the war. Uh, here's what he write I cannot forget the war. Or like to, I might pass two or three days without thinking of it, and then suddenly I see it again. I undergo it again. And I feel frightened. 20 years. And for 20 years, despite life, despite pain and happiness, I've not cleansed myself of the war. The horror of these four years is still in me. I carry the mark. All survivors carry the mark. Thank you.